Welcome to worship today. We're in the last chapter of the book of Job. We're in the chapter, the end, that is a new beginning. It tells us a story and creates a picture where all that came before is renewed, reworked, restored, redeemed. God rewrites Job's story in the last chapter. God can rewrite our story. God can rewrite our stories, editing our, our lives with forgiveness and grace, creating a story that speaks of love. I invite you to join us this morning as we think about what it means to be restored. Job answered the Lord, I know you can do anything. No plan of yours can be opposed successfully. He said, Who is this darkening counsel without knowledge? I have indeed spoken about things I didn't understand, wonders beyond my comprehension. He said, Listen, and I will speak. I will question you, and you will inform me. My ears had heard about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I relent and find comfort on dust and ashes. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, he said to Eliphaz from Teman, I'm angry at you and your two friends because you haven't spoken about me correctly, as did my servant Job. So now, take seven bulls and seven rams, go to my servant Job, and prepare an entirely burnt offering for yourselves. Job, my servant, will pray for you, and I will act favorably by not making fools of you because you didn't speak correctly, as did my servant Job. Eliphaz from Teman, Bildad from Shua, and Zophar from Nama did what the Lord told them, and the Lord acted favorably toward Job. Then the Lord changed Job's fortune when he prayed for his friends, and the Lord doubled all Job's earlier possessions. All his brothers, sisters, and acquaintances came to him and ate food with him in his house. They comforted and consoled him concerning all the disaster the Lord had brought on him, and each one gave him a quesita and a golden ring. Then the Lord blessed Job's later days more than his former ones. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of ox, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named one Jemiah, a second Keziah, and a third Karen Hapuch. No women in the land were as beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave an inheritance to them as long as their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw, gener and saw four generations of his children. Then Job died old and satisfied. We just finished reading Where the Crawdads Sing. And I have to tell you, I love the book until the last three pages. And the last three pages 
made me hate the story. It changed everything that I knew about the characters. It changed how I felt about the main character. It made me feel discombobulated because what I had read in the text up until that point didn't completely support the ending. And so part of me said she just needed a better editor. If she wanted to do that ending, then she needed to fix some of that stuff in the middle so that it made more sense to fit with the end. So instead, I was left with this feeling of, gosh, I really, really, really liked it until there. And sometimes I feel that way about the Book of Job. I really, really have trouble with the ending. I really struggle with the ending of Job. Because at the very end of Job, it says God blessed his latter days more than his former days. That he is restored to his fortunes, that he gets back children, he gets back cattle, he gets back wealth and riches, he gets back friends and family. And he lives a long and full life, old and satisfied. And I hate that story partly because how can you talk about restoring children? I mean, so I have two takes on it. One is any parent who has ever lost a child even if new children come after the loss of the one child, is a little bit broken from the loss of the one child. It always has that child present in their hearts. It feels a little lost without it. But I also think about families that have been broken by divorce, by abandonment. And the story sort of discounts them, dismisses them. Like, I know in Job's case, all the children are dead, but there are so many families where after a divorce, one or both of the parents remarry and start having more kids with their new partners. And that child feels left behind, left out, not quite good enough. And in some cases is treated completely different than the other children. And so this idea that Job gets a brand new family that is better than the old family bothers me. It breaks my heart for all those kids who ever had to feel that way, that they weren't good enough, that they weren't enough, that the new siblings are better. So what do we do with the ending of Job? How do we reconcile what happens with the point of the discussion of the rest of the book? So one of the theories of the book of Job and its writing is that these prose sections, the first part of Job and the very last part of Job, were a morality tale that floated around during the time of the writing of this book that everyone knew of, about the character Job. And in this story, a capricious god does horrible things to Job. And after the God is done with these horrible acts, he makes everything better, puts everything back together again. And the author of the book of Job then wanted to take that morality tale and say that's not how suffering works. That's not how God works. 
And so all the prose, all the poetry, all the imagery in the middle is an argument against the story that frames it. But if that's the case, how do we deal with this ending in Dope? I mean, we could argue maybe it should just end with the line, I relent and find comfort on dust and ashes. Maybe the end is Job's final response to God, right? So in the end, we remember that God has appeared out of the whirlwind and spoke to Job about the wonders of creation, sharing with him everything in and around creation and the amazing things that happen in creation, the wondrous, wild, amazing earth that was formed and how God moves in that earth all over it with every created being. And then after God is done speaking, we get these lines from Job. Job answered the Lord, I know you can do anything. No plans of yours can be opposed successfully. You said, who is this darkening counsel without knowledge? I have indeed spoken about things I don't understand, wonders beyond my comprehension. You said, listen, and I will speak. I will question you and you will inform me. My ears had heard about you, but my, my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I relent and find comfort on dust and ashes. So basically, Job here says, I thought I understand who you, who you were. I thought I got it. I thought I understand what was going on and what everything was about. And then you came to me and you talked. And when you spoke, I realized there was so much that I didn't understand and didn't get. But now I've heard it. Now not only have I heard about you and about what you can do, how I've seen it. I understand it in a way that I didn't before. And because now I understand it, I relent. So this is an interesting textual difficulty. How do we interpret verse 6? Because if you open up your Bibles, many of them are going to say, I repent on my dust and ashes. But here's the thing about repent. Sometimes it means what we think of when we think of the word repent, where we think of having acknowledged our sins, told God about our sins, confessed our sins, and asked for forgiveness. We repent of the actions that we have taken, the words we have misspoke, the deeds we have done, the sins we have committed. But repent doesn't always mean that in the Hebrew scriptures. Sometimes repent means I changed my mind. I changed how I feel about what I just saw, what I just experienced. I changed my being. I turn around and turn back to God, which is very different than asking for forgiveness of sins. And what Job is saying in this is that I thought I had understood who you were, God. I thought I got it. I thought I knew what was happening. And because I thought I knew, I wanted to talk to you. I wanted to experience your presence so I could tell you how wrong it is what happened to me. I wanted that opportunity. I wanted to be able to state my case 
to you so that you could hear and feel and experience my pain. And then when you came, it wasn't what I expected. What I had thought I was going to see isn't what happened. What I thought I would hear isn't the words that were spoken. But now that you've shown me this alternative, now that you've shared some of the mystery that I didn't get, now that I have grown deeper in my connection to you and my understanding of you, I've changed my mind. I've changed my mind. And I'm willing to give up that argument. Because even though you didn't answer my question, I find comfort in what you did give me. I find comfort in your presence. And so maybe the part of this ending that we're supposed to remember isn't necessarily the restoration. So Job changed his mind. And when Job changed his mind, his world began to change. His world began to open up. And when his world began to open up, his friends changed, his family changed, and his fortunes began to change. And I think that's part of the journey when you're in a place of suffering. It's hard to see what's on the other side. It's hard to think about what will be next. It is hard to imagine a place outside of that suffering. But when we work our way through the suffering, when we work our way through the pain and anguish, when we work our way through the trauma, when we worked on ourselves, when we fixed ourselves, when we've transformed ourselves from the ball of pain into a functioning adult, a functioning human, our lives return to a different rhythm, a restored rhythm, a rhythm that is renewed and renewing. And maybe that's what the descriptions of what happens to Job is about. It's about showing us how we can live through the suffering. We can live through the trauma and make it to the other side. We can make it to that point where we can say at the end of our lives that we died old and satisfied. Amen. I invite you to settle in for this time of prayer. I invite you to close your eyes and breathe in deeply and release your breath. I invite you to breathe in and release your breath. I invite you to rest here in the stillness of God.
restoration. God, today we hear in your word that Job was restored. He received money and jewelry, animals and children. Everything went back to normal. It was bigger, prettier, more. Restoration. Is that what it means to be restored, to have what once was only better? We hear a lot about restoration. We hear people wanting to go back to normal. We hear people promising a return to a better times, times when people were civil to each other, times when things were simpler, slower, easier. Restoration. You speak to us of restoration. You speak to us of wholeness. You speak to us not restored to what was, but brought into something new. You speak to us of being freed from prison, captives being released, the oppressed set free. You speak to us of being able to hear and see, being able to walk and dance and leap. You speak to us of a world of love where family and neighbors, friends and strangers, enemies eat together, sharing a meal, where no one goes hungry and everyone is fed, where our needs are met. Restore us, Holy One. Restore us, Holy One. Restore those in need of your healing presence and touch right now. Restore those in need of a job, a place to live, food to eat. Restore us, Lord. Restore us who are seeking justice, who seek an end to racism, who seek an end to the destruction of our climate. Restore us, O Lord. Restore us to the life you imagine, the world you create, the people you dream. As we pray together the prayer that you, Jesus taught his disciples, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We thank you for joining us, and if you would like to support our ministries, I invite you to go to stpaulshinkley.org where you can donate online. Please join me in prayer. God, we see people come to Job offering him comfort. They came and sat down to eat with him, console him, and then offer him what they could. Help us to give these gifts from our hearts that we may that they may be used to console and comfort our community. Amen. And if nobody told you today that I love you, remember that God loves you and always will. Remember that Jesus loves you and always will. Remember that I love you and always will. May you be comforted. May you bring comfort. May you find the restoration you need. Amen.